Um, my name is Simi Dixit. I'm the national coordinator for a program called Multimedia and Multiculturalism, which is run by an organization called the United Nations Association of Canada. Um, we have offices all over the country, but I'm based here in Ottawa. That's where our headquarters are. So there's this program all across the country, and I'm guessing it's relatively new? Yeah, so multimedia and multiculturalism, do you want, I'll, I'll break it down for you if you want, um, is a program that I guess took off in January, that's when I started with it. It's a three-year project that looks at enhancing a sense of belonging among, I guess, all communities in Canada um, by looking at how the media fails to adequately and proportionally represent uh, multicultural, ethnocultural, visible minority and newcomer communities in the country. Um, so how this project came about, it basically is building on a series of projects that preceded it um, that were all based on enhancing a sense of belonging. So a sense of belonging, you might ask yourself what that is. Like at the end of the day, when we go to school, when we go through our day to day, how integrated, how accepted, how at ease do we feel moving through our days. So we went and talked to a bunch of youth to see how they felt um, in their day to day, particularly youth from ethnocultural communities. And they said the biggest missing link, I guess, between them feeling a real sense of belonging and not was the media. They felt like their lives, their communities weren't adequately represented by the media um, and multimedia. So not just TV, but radio, newspapers, social media. So what we're trying to do is look at points of entry to make the media more inclusive of uh, ethnocultural realities and communities across the country. So um, you talked about points of entry. Mm -hmm. uh, points of entry for people to make media? Or points, like what do you mean by points of entry? By points of entry, we just mean where we're, like what's a starting point? So um, the first thing that we did was we developed a really cool internship program. So we basically uh, did a call out for interns or students who were in uh, communications, journalism, media programs in universities across the country who identified with an ethnocultural community or were a new, from a newcomer community. And uh, we basically coordinated with mainstream media outlets and community media outlets and set them up there for a six week internship. We, before like, you know, just throwing them to the wolves, because we all know the, the media industry can be particularly um, brutal, especially with interns. We gave them a, a two-day briefing session, so talked a lot about critical analysis, how to look at discrimination in the workplace. We, we basically opened up a dialogue with them about how they could critically look at how content is being produced behind the scenes, so they could better understand how news media um, and all forms of media are being produced. We had over 300 applicants across the country. Uh, we selected 20 of them. We brought them all to Ottawa. Did a lot of you know team building and skill building for a couple of days, and then sent them off into their internships and obviously supporting them through that process as they uh, they go through their many successes and challenges day to day. So is that like currently going? Or is that That's going? happening right now, actually. Um, it started. It, we kicked it off in June, and um, most of them will be winding down uh, right around now. And so we're going to bring them all back and they're going to have a chance to process and tell us about what they learned. And I think the key to having a project be, I think, effective is making it sustainable. So what we're then going to do is we're going to get them to go into high schools and talk to students about their experiences, about the merits and their, like, the realities of what it is like in a media room. So that's one part. Another part we're looking at is basically building media literacy. Um, we're seeing like a, like a major departure from traditional forms of media to social media. Um, and what does that mean for the way we ourselves produce media, because that's what we're doing with YouTube and Facebook, and how are we consuming media? So enhancing media literacy for people who might not necessarily be using media as a form of communication or expression. Doing that, we're doing programs in high schools, workshops. Uh, we are holding roundtable discussions in communities all over the country to kind of get a sense of regionally how these issues play out. Because it's one thing to say like, oh, multiculturalism, Canada, and, and have sweeping ideas about what it is for people, but we're not in a position to be talking for people. We're just in a position to listen and uh, maybe build some activities that create a greater sense of inclusion. Now, I guess there's a couple of ways to go. 
you talked about so people being in the media, making media, um, and I heard you on CBC talking about there's also kind of misrepresentations. Um, and is that dealt with through media literacy, or, or what happens in that? Well, I guess media literacy, first of all, gives people like it's just basic skills on, on how to access different forms of media if you're not used to using YouTube or if you want to stream news online. So that's what media literacy looks at. In terms of misrepresentation, I think that's more the crux of the issue that sort of floored this project. And what that basically means is when we are seeing diversity portrayed in the media, it's always pretty sensational. Oh, a mosque burnt down. Oh, it's Chinese New Year. Oh, check out this great Indian recipe for curry. And we're always seeing uh, multiculturalism being portrayed in these like clumps, which pretty much further stereotypes and kind of either other communities or just exoticize them. So what we want to see is just a, I guess, a more integrated perspective of multiculturalism, not just see like brown people when there's a brown holiday, um, or like see it as a form of tokenism, but see it something that's just very naturally and organically woven into news on a day to day. So are there other models that have kind of tried to approach this uh, this problem? And well, I mean, there's there's been a lot of talk. Like this conversation isn't new, but I think. And I mentioned this earlier on CBC. I think the, the missing piece is building bridges between like schools, between integration organizations, between public interest groups, between media organizations. So I think the piece there is, because everybody knows it's happening, and everybody's trying to do things, but um, when you have, when you have, I guess when you have like segmentation happening, but you don't have people working together, um, then you can't really look at changing an institution as a whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like all the Cheerios are in the bowl, but if there's no milk, you can't really get like a spoonful and experience like the whole thing. <laughs> it's a terrible analogy. Do you, do you think it's, it's possible to change? Is it, like when you talk about institutions, are you talking about like the mainstream corporate media? Is that like? I'm talking about the, the main, yeah, that's a good question, actually. I'm talking about um, mainstream corporate media. I'm also talking just about, like, consciousness, just about our, our faith and what we read, because some people just don't have any faith anymore, because they're so tired of bullshit. They're so tired of corruption or, like, you know, old white guys doing the wrong thing, paying everybody's bills, and it's not a new story. And I'm not saying down with the institution. But I am saying I think it's really important to be open about that conversation. Uh, real change takes a really long time, but I think you have to believe that uh, that can happen. I don't think there's any harm in that. And, and tonight is a conversation, kind of like what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So we're having this, uh, this great panel discussion that's going to bring um, some academics some news media persons, uh, some spoken word artists together to talk about what they feel, how they feel these issues play out in Ottawa, you know, the, the glorious nation's capital, but what's really going on behind the scenes. So I don't know what to expect, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what people's views are about, and I think those conversations can help spur partnerships, can help spur further dialogues, can help really plant seeds for us to look at building some new activities. If people are interested in, uh, in finding out more about this project, how do they do so? Well, you can check out our website at www.mmunac.org. Uh, you can get a hold of myself, uh, Simi Dixit. Uh, my contact is up on the website. Or our Ottawa Regional Coordinator, Shelby Daigle. Um, I'm happy to provide more contact details if you would like. Um. This is a project that the United Nations AC. What's the AC <laughs> So I, this is a this is a great question. So we aren't the United Nations per se, the giant international organization. Um, we are the United Nations Association of Canada. So there's a worldwide federation of United Nations associations that are basically like small scale UN that work to educate the public on the broader mandates of the UN. So good government, equality diversity, human rights, basically, through a series of projects. So that's what we do. Um, we are pretty much a, a national body, if you will. And uh, we work with communities uh, regionally, provincially, municipalities. And you mentioned there are a couple of programs before this launch mm -hmm. this year. Um, 
when, when did you become involved in this project? Where with the United Nations? Um, I, I, I got involved with them, I guess, when I was hired at the end of last November. Okay. And that was specifically for this project? Specifically for this project. I myself have been working on, uh, I have a background in migration and I've been working on, uh, I guess, cultural issues, youth issues, um, integration, uh, anti-oppression work for the past, I guess, six or seven years. And I came across this job and I was just, I was really fascinated by it. So I applied and uh, somehow tricked them into hiring me and lo and behold, here I am. What, what is it about this that really inspired you? Um, I'm, I'm a second generation Indo-Canadian um, and I remember, I remember when I was little, I remember, I remember the disconnect I always felt at school. I remember feeling different and I didn't know why. I mean obviously you know when other kids are white and you're brown, there's that visual discrepancy but socially I just always felt like the fabric was lacking and I just remember like watching my parents, like the the small nuances of their day-to-day -day that just made it a little more difficult than it needed to be. And it, it just resonated with me and it stayed with me and I guess um, that's what spoke to me about this because as I got older and I sort of being able to have conversations and naming the things I felt when I was little, it was really, it was really liberating and empowering. And it's also just really fascinating to understand like what's really happening around you under the air, under the words, you know, so. Um, no, I guess that's it. Thank you for your time you. and for, for caring a lot.